Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, showing up uh, relatively early. Um, I'm going to talk about a subject that is uh, near, in my, near and dear to my heart, adding benchmark uh, results support to KTAP. Um, and I'll, I'll just get right into it. Um, I like to throw the, the abstract into the slides just so that when people download it later, they have kind of a summary. So I'm going to skip that. So uh, what I want to do is just go really quickly through kind of how our benchmarks are used today. Um, and then talk about how that presents some problems for test automation. And I have a proposed solution, and we'll see how the demonstration goes. Uh, I actually have it pre recorded, so <laughs> it should at least go as well as my recording. Uh, and then uh, we'll, I'd like to talk through some issues and uh, uh, kind of get your opinion on things. So, how are benchmarks used today? Well, um, Mostly, it's a human, uh, in terms of actually getting test results that are fed back into uh, the development process, it's a human, very human oriented process, right? A human knows what the benchmark value should be for their machine. And, and in particular, they also kind of know what variance is allowed, right? If you're doing a, a storage benchmark, you get, a, you get a certain number and you kind of know, well, it might not be that exact number, but if it's close enough, it's like, well, what is close enough? So uh, the tester then runs the benchmark, examines the results manually, and, and then determines if the, the performance has regressed on their hardware. Um, and that's actually kind of a, a key problem for doing this at scale uh, in the community. Um, the tester reports a bug, and then if something changes, something like the, the software uh, changes, or the hardware, the configuration settings, or even the workload, uh, then the tester relearns uh, what the threshold values are they, uh, and, and what the variances are for that new situation. So it's not only a manual process, but it's a manual process that's ongoing, right? So it's very hard to automate. Um, so um, the rationale for supporting benchmark data is there's a whole set of features in the kernel that we don't actually, that get tested, but not, not with the same kind of rigor that we use for testing functionality, right? So we have, uh, we have K self test, we have uh, K unit that are testing very specific uh, features, either of individual functions within the kernel or individual features. But we're not, and, and people run tests of performance and they look at it, but it's all a manual process. We're not doing it in a, uh, uh, in kind of a rigorous way. Um, and so in, in order to do this, what we have to do is we have to find a way to convert that numeric data that we're getting back from benchmarks. And in here, I'm using the term benchmark in a very um, general way. Basically, anything that can return you a number instead of pass fail, I consider to be a benchmark. So that could be something like CPU utilization, right? You may want, want to see that go above a certain thing, amount. It could be things like latencies, okay, so anything that's returning a number. Um, so you have to convert that into uh, a pass-fail, and the normal way this is done is with uh, what I'm calling a reference value. So a reference value represents that threshold that is used to determine whether the test has passed or failed. Um, and uh, so this may include uh, uh, some, some delta, some wiggle room for variance. Uh, but the main thing, in order to do this at scale, I believe that you have to keep those reference values separate from the test itself. They have to be kept outside the test. But that raises a lot of issues. And issues that so far, I mean, we've been, we've been doing, I, I first started working on a test lab for the Linux kernel in like 2006. Um, and we've been actually maybe even before then. So it's been over 20 years we've tried to do testing for the kernel. And we've never cracked the nut on how to do performance testing uh, at scale. Um, so what happens when we try to keep those reference values separate from the test itself? Um, so it makes, if you don't keep them separate, right, it makes the test specific to one uh, situation. And that means that you can't share the test. If you've got the reference values encoded into the test itself, 
you can't just give that to another developer, right? So the storage numbers I'm going to get back on my Raspberry Pi or my BeagleBone or some other embedded development board, they're not going to match the, the performance numbers on, you know, the top 500 CPU, uh, 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 yeah, uh, supercomputers. And so um, as the other thing about this is it's not just a difference between machines, it's, uh, it's a difference in, um, in time. Over time, the numbers are going to change. And you actually want to adapt those numbers. And so having them in, in the, if you encode the numbers into the test themselves, then you're constantly having to, to change the test. Um, and, and that's undesirable. It just doesn't scale. So, but here's some of the issues that crop up, okay? So if you're keeping these reference values separate from the test, where are you going to store them? Can you store them upstream? And I would argue you probably can't. Um, or, or maybe you can store some, of, well, there are certain situations. This is the discussion I want to have. What format are you going to use for those reference values to kind of make it so that it's a standard across the industry? Um, and then how do you determine at runtime what's, what the mapping is from your test environment to the set of reference values you're going to use? So you're going to have multiple sets of reference values. Like I said, you're going to have some for BeagleBone. You're going to have some for you know, a, a high-end Intel machine. You're going to have different ones for a, a server. So where are they stored? How do you, how do you make sure that you're, when you're running, you're you know, detecting your regressions based on those reference values, that you're picking up the right file? And how are they generated, right? So there's still a human in the process that has to look at those numbers and determine you know, what is the actual number you want, right? And it's, that's not an easy process, right? So, one of the most challenging things as a, as a tester is, you know, you, you run, this happened all the time with LTP. Uh, you, you, some, it was invariably when you're running a Linux test project, a couple of things fail. And you always go, well, is that okay? Did, was that supposed to fail? Was that expected? Um, so I have a proposal um, and it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty simple proposal. Uh, and, but uh, it consists of these parts. So I want to add just a couple of tweaks to KTAP to support expressing numeric values into, into KTAP. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the details here in a sec section, uh, uh, in a second. Um, I want to have a collection of reference values defined somewhere uh, to be determined um, uh, that can be used with benchmark results. And we also need uh, criteria and I'll, I'll, for interpreting those test result values. And I'll talk about the rationale for that. And then you need an actual tool that can do that conversion, right? Can take the numeric results, convert it into pass-fail, uh, or in the case of KTAP, okay, not okay lines. Um, and then optionally, uh, I've also written, just, just get barely gotten started with a tool that helps you manage reference values, right? That allows you to look at past results and say, well, you know, what do I want to use to update my, the reference values that I'm working with? So um, these, are the, these are the different system objects. Uh, this is kind of a repeat of the last slide, but uh, um, the actual test results in KTAP format are what we're going to be working with. Um, we're going to have reference value files, so files that contain numbers uh, that we're comparing against. And then we're going to have a set of rules for applying those uh, values that we receive versus the reference values. And the reason that you have separate, a separate file for that is because the, the sense of the, um, of the uh, operation, uh, like are you doing a less than, are you doing a greater than, are you doing an equals, um, so that has to change depending on the type of thing you're doing. And this is intended to be a generalized system. And, and then the final thing is uh, the actual results evaluation tool. So the tool that will, that will make those uh, inferences. Okay, so here's what I'm proposing for KTAP syntax extensions. I have just two simple extensions and these are backwards compatible. Um, uh, a new line or a new syntax for value output to indicate value output and an undetermined test case result. And I'll talk about that in a second. So the first one, uh, the value output is very simple. Again, I feel like it's almost so simple that it's like, uh, uh, you know, why, why do we even need to talk about it? But, but I'm sure there'll be people who disagree. Um, 
So the value line starts with the word value. It has an, a value identifier, an equal sign, uh, a numeric part, and then the units. And then there's actually an optional comment on that line. Um, and then for reasons that I'll explain in just a second, uh, I, it's important to have an undetermined uh, outcome result. And so I want to actually add it to the set of things that you can put at the front of a KTAP line, we've got OK and not OK, and I want to add unknown um, to, to that. And this will indicate data that has not yet been, or a test case that has not yet been analyzed, has not been, yet been processed. Um, and the reason for that, I'll, I'll explain in a second. So the reference values themselves, um, I'm proposing that they be kept in a standalone file. Um, they can also be embedded in, inside the criteria rules, uh, but they also have the exact same syntax as the KTAP line. So it's just value, some value identifier equals, and number in units. Um, the reference values files would consist of just a set of lines. Uh, so these are greppable. Um, the file names, I, I would recommend reflect the test name, machine identifier, or environment. Uh, and so uh, you'll be able to identify just by looking at a directory of files which reference file might apply to your environment. So for instance, the file name might include Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone or, um, and I'll, I'll show some more examples of that. Uh, in the future, we might talk about, want to talk about more complex systems like that include metadata for more advanced matching, but I think that's beyond the scope of this, this presentation. Um, the test criteria, this is probably a new concept that uh, if you haven't been working with this, maybe you haven't thought about. This is the actual rule for evaluating uh, the test result versus the reference file. And the reason you need this is, again, because you have different uh, operations that you have to perform. Uh, like I said, you could be, it could be, the operation could be a less than, it could be a greater than. The other thing is that the criteria can include since it includes the units, it allows you to do unit conversions. So if you're getting a test that has a reference value in gigabits per second, uh, but your test returns megabits, uh, megabits per second, that you can detect that, that difference and either automatically convert it or warn the user that something's off. So this is what one of these lines look like. Uh, if IO4K write speed is less than 90 megabits per second, plus or minus 5%, then IO4K right equals not OK. OK, so that actually should be fairly human readable, right? It should, it should just look like an if-then conditional uh, that explains you know, what the outcome is going to be based on, on that comparison. OK, so then we have the results evaluation tool. And that's a tool that actually performs the evaluation. It's very, again, it's, all, it's so simple. Uh, it's not a lot of lines of code, um, but it basically, so the trick here, though, is that it does have two modes of operation. So you've got a mo oper mode of operation where you can perform the evaluation actually during the test. And it has a post-processing mode where you can perform the evaluation uh, after the results have been produced. Um, so let's look at those two. In during test mode, uh, the test will actually, as it receives uh, a numeric value, as the benchmark or whatever is measuring this, this device under test receives an individual value, it will pass that to either a library or a program that can then read the reference file, read the criteria rule, perform the evaluation, and produce the outcome. Um, so that's very straightforward. However, okay, so this is good uh, because it allows the test to provide everything that it used to. It, it provides it, it allows it to indicate the outcome immediately along with the test result. The bad thing, though, is that this requires that your benchmark understands the whole criteria system. You have to introduce a new system call or a new uh, uh, function uh, exec to an external program. And a lot of ben you would not be able to support existing benchmarks this way. Um, so uh, so the only, only tests that were already aware of the criteria system would be able to use the during test method. The other way that you can, oh, and the, the results processing flow. So uh, this slide is almost too obvious to have to read, but basically if you had this, ref, if you had this value that you got back uh, and this, refer, or this reference value of 90 megabytes 
this criteria rule, and then you called, uh, in this case, the, the function is the, it's an external program that's in Python called process results, and you give it the, the value for the expression value, and you have to refer to the reference file and the criteria file, then you actually get the line that you can put in your KTAP results, okay? So that's the, that final line there, not OK, 12, IO, 4K, sequential read. Um, the other mode you can do is in post-processing mode. And this would apply for other, other um, tests that are not aware of this whole uh, system. Uh, what happens in this case is you would produce, uh, the benchmark can produce a, a set of values and if it's at least marginally aware, it can also indicate that it has unknown test case outcomes. Um, it's not required, right? You can, write a, you can write a wrapper that will just take the values from an existing benchmark and annotate the, the test case results. Um, but then what happens is you use process results as a post-processor. So this reads the test output, uh, the value lines out of that, out of that output, uh, reads the reference files and criteria, and then writes new test output uh, and provides new outcome lines. Now, this is pretty easy to do. Um, the good thing about this is it does not require that tests know anything about this system. Um, uh, but uh, it does present a problem that there's, uh, you might have unknown outcomes in your test results temporarily. So you can't do things like counting uh, at the time of the test. So the, you know, the, the classic line at the bottom of your test that says, oh, I had this many successes, this many fails, you'd have to either add an unknown thing or, or just, not, just omit those or update those in the results um, when, once, they, once the actual tally of results is known. Uh, that's usually not a problem because any benchmark that doesn't already know about this system is not producing that set of numbers anyway, right? There, there's no benchmark that says, oh yeah, five of your performance tests failed, right? Uh, it doesn't have a count because it doesn't even have the notion of, of test case outcomes. Okay, so that's, this is what, so in, in this example, uh, the tool, uh, the, the benchmark itself would produce the, this top box here, value IO4K sequential read speed is 78 megabits, uh, megabytes, and then it would say, just say unknown, and then it just um, converts that to a not okay. So post-processing, pretty simple process. Um, so now I have a demonstration. So these tools don't, uh, these tools actually exist. Uh, and uh, this will require that I go to a YouTube thing. I didn't want to do this live, because uh, that is fraught with peril. But I'm gonna try to share an external video. And this unfortunately requires that I'm gonna be accurate on typing a YouTube URL, <laughs> which is a, as I'm sure you're aware, is not a X, S, all kinds of capitals and lowercase. Let's see. Hopefully I typed that correctly. Okay, and then So there should be sound on this. If there's not, I'll just tell you what's going on. Um, so this is a DDIO test. This is just a short, a small wrapper around uh, DD, the DD command, which runs a bunch of block operations. This is testing a flash drive and a spinning drive. Notice that uh, this is just a wrapper around DD, so it's not DD itself, but it produces these value lines with, with unknown test case results. And then uh, what I'm gonna show you here is uh, a directory full of reference values and a criteria file. So notice I have reference values for a bunch of different machines on, in my lab. I've got one for uh, Timdesk. I'm gonna show you the contents of that. Uh, Timdesk happens to be my, my desktop machine. And look, it's very simple. It's just a bunch of, these are the threshold values that I'm expecting to see as outcome for uh, what, what it should be, notice. Uh, I, <clears throat> and then I think the next thing I'm gonna show is uh, the criteria file. I use wildcards a lot to. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this has got a very simple 
uh, criteria, and I'm using a wild card.
I hope I have a l enough time to just finish. Uh, where is it? Yeah, let's let's we can open up for questions now. And this should go back to my should go back to my presentation. What happened? Oh, do I have to stop the video? Yeah, stop the video. And no, share, share presentation, not screen. Well, I don't know what I'm doing with this, but anyway, okay. So we're very limited in time. I'm sorry, I had way too many slides for what's supposed to be a discu motor discussion oriented, but uh, go ahead. So uh, my question is, uh, wouldn't it be useful to encode yeah, the the just the the comparison sign of the criteria into the tab as well? So like, if we assuming that someone wants to just use the output format that you're proposing, without the evaluation side, the all the storage, right? Can yeah. we say like so min max exact I've in the output? I've actually been thinking a lot about that, right? Because I I've written several different rules now, and it, oh sorry, oh uh, yeah, let me I'll I'll switch places. <laughs> Yeah, I've thought a lot about that. Uh, I've written several, several criteria evaluation rules to see if that needs to be abstracted. Every single time, it's the, the end thing is not OK, so I'm not sure that that's really necessary to specify that. Uh, so I may have put in more flexibility than is needed. It, I, it, systems that I've worked with before, in particular Fuego, only have the operator. Um, I do think, though, that the units is useful. And uh, I've added flexibility that you can have the, the value identifier and the test case identifier don't have to match. Uh, so the reason to have like kind of a fully fledged conditional rule there uh, is that you may, have, you may have a mismatch between the name of the value that you're looking at and the uh, actual test case right. result name. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a difference there that you have to account for. I was hoping that we can basically create a system which, like, based on the previous runs, we can also evaluate. So without the criteria, without storing the, explicitly storing the, 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 pre, the, the results like, somewhere, we can, we'll right. just have a database of old results. And then if we know that the... Right. So, so I have a tool that looks at old results. So that's the, this is the other really huge thing about... Uh, doing doing this, a lot of times your reference values come from a prior prior run, a known okay run, right? And so, but that means you have to have a database of the runs somewhere. And so, not only so, uh, if you use r past results as your reference values, which is a perfectly valid thing to do, uh, you still have to have this external file that you're referring to, and you have to know where the collection is. So the reason that I made the KTAP value lines the identical syntax uh, as the reference value files is that you can do that. You can actually just put a symlink, say, uh, I, I want to refer to Tuesday's run, or you know, I want to refer to the 6.11 run of the kernel, and have that be the reference values. And uh, the system works as is. Uh, so. So yes, and then I also wrote a tool that I didn't have time to discuss today that allows you to look at, if you have your, this database of past results, you can look at it and it will show you like the averages, min, man, uh, min max, and standard deviation, and z-score, and a bunch of statistics, so that allows a human to pick reference values that kind of match your data. Right, you run, the, you run your tool several times or over several versions, and you start to get a feel as a human for what the value is. Again, a human has to be picking the reference values um, because only there's just too much. A human knows what, what is a good run versus a bad run, or they should. That's kind of your job as a tester. So, yeah, I'm out of time. I would love to talk to more people about this. There'll be patches coming to the list soon. Uh, and I, I really want to get more feedback on this. Uh, so I don't want to. I really don't want to standardize something prematurely, right? I don't want to get it into like the KTAP documentation, or put the parser upstream until, you know, I've heard feedback and and gotten gotten more information. So, anyway, thank you very much.